Hello, and welcome to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and I'm delighted to have with us two extraordinarily talented writers, Anna Lee Huber and A.M. Stewart, also known as Allison Stewart. Uh, before we begin our chat, I do want to let those listening in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of both Anna's and Allison's new book, and we would be happy to hold one for you or put it in the mail. All you need to do is give us a call or go online to the web store, and we can get those books in your hands ASAP. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome in Allison and Anna. Hi, well, thank you. Thank for you so much welcome. for having us. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. I always like to start with authors by asking them to kind of tell us a little bit about their life before they became a published writer or kind of your origin stories. So why don't we start with you, Anna? Sure, yeah. Um, so I always loved reading. As a kid, I actually, I started writing also when I was in elementary school, I had my own little um, like fictional Nancy Drew solving team crew uh, that I was writing about, things like that. Um, and then it kind of fell by the wayside. I was focusing on my music. That's my other love. Um, and I went to college for music and I thought I was going to be a performer. And um, I got out of college and I realized, you know, I didn't necessarily want to do opera. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was in Nashville and I was kind of trying to break in there and um, just trying to do, trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do. Did I want to go to grad school? Did I want to go to law school? And I just started dabbling in writing again. Um, and I just re-fell in love with it. And I realized, you know, this was what I really wanted to do. Um, and I just kind of never looked back. I mean, that's basically how I got my start. <laughs> how about you, Allison? Who were you before you became a writer? Um, right. Well, I, as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm, I'm not sitting in the US at the moment. I'm sitting <laughs> in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, but I was actually born in East Africa in Kenya. Um, and my parents moved to Australia when I was 10. And I've never quite lost the accent. Um, so, yeah, very like Anna, you know, I started writing when I was able to hold a pen, really. And, uh, you know, life interfered and all the rest of it. And my husband, uh, who periodically kills, tries to kill me on every holiday we go on, this time by giving <laughs> me COVID, um, decided we went, we went on a skiing holiday. And uh, I still could hear him say, That's, this doesn't look too steep. <laughs> One dislocated shoulder later, I was stuck in the ski lodge with uh, with a, and um, I started to write the book that had been tugging at my sleeve for a very long time. And uh, that was it. I was hooked from there. As to what I actually did for a living, um, I was I was a lawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, 30, 30 years. I'm now a recovering, recovering lawyer. Um, but I, I didn't. Um, I, I, I had a sort of kind of different career. I dabbled in, I, I actually worked in the Army Reserve as a military lawyer for over nearly 20 years. And mm -hmm. I worked for uh, not-for-profits and uh, emergency services, men in uniform, really, I have to say. <laughs> it's probably it. And 2017 decided to take the risk. And um, I, I really felt Singapore Sapphire, which is the first of the Harriet stories, had legs. And I really wanted to really give it a good go and, uh, and try writing the series. So... We looked at the figures and decided I could retire. Yes. <laughs> so when I say retire, I write full time now, and that's way harder. <laughs> now, I was fascinated, Allison, when I read that you kind of were introduced to your series character, Harriet, in the microfish room of a library. Was that true? That's absolutely true. Yes, we uh, in 2000, we had the opportunity to go and live in Singapore, which we, uh, with my husband was working for an American multinational company. And uh, it was a it was a bit of a weird time. I mean, my kids were miserable and they had school. My husband was never at home because he was traveling all over Southeast Asia. And I had had to give up my career to move here and, and just didn't know what to do with myself. So I, 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 I latched into a writing group and um, decided this was, this was my opportunity to actually do some writing. So I'd go to the end of the National Library and I'd fiddle faddle around, really interested in the history of Singapore and doing tours and things like that. And I was flicking through the microfiche of the old, of the Straits Times, which is the major newspaper, still is for, for Singapore. And there on the, uh, the front page was this quite large ad um, a, an English woman undertakes shorthand and typing and went on to give the details and the, the, the last line was absolute secrecy and confidentiality assured mm. and she just leapt off the page at me I mean 
poor woman. I mean, she, she didn't end up. By, I, I have done a bit of research into who she was, but um, yeah, she became Harriet Gordon. <laughs> now, for you, Anna, Lady Darby kind of appeared full blown almost in your mind. Yeah, it was interesting. I I was actually um, working on something else at the time, um, and all of a sudden, this voice. Was started talking to me in my head, like nudging me, like wanting me to, to 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 write her story instead. And I was like, so I set aside what I was working on because they always say, you know, don't you know, keep don't just keep starting things that you need yeah. to come. If you're going to be published, you got to finish something. So to, to yeah. see it through. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. And so I set it aside and I I let this voice just talk to me. I was like, I'll I'll just give it a day or two, and. Um, pretty much the first chapter of The Anatomous Wife just almost came out exactly how she just was telling it to me. And I was like, just so intrigued. And I was like, who is this woman? And then I had to stop and, and really figure out, you know, why, why is she telling me this? Who is she? What is her backstory? What happened to her? Um, but, it, but it was funny that she just kind of came to me that way. And she still talks to me that way. So... <laughs> Um, now let's talk a little bit about your new books, which are part of the series. For you, Anna, it's a perilous perspective. What can you tell those listening in about this book? So it's the tenth book in the series, um, and we at the end of a wicked conceit, book nine, um, Kira and Gage have welcomed their first child, um, and her friend Charlotte is about to marry her cousin Rye, and so they are headed off to Argyle, which is in uh, western Scotland, the Highlands, um, near the Hebrides um, area, for their wedding. It's kind of a getaway also, a time for them to relax, um, and it's a beautiful area. I got to visit there um, like 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, it's very rural. Um, it's one of those places where you can just kind of park your car and like walk up to this castle and you have the whole place to yourself and just walk around. And I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I um, mean, it's ain't the area of ancient Scotland. There's lots of cairns and sto standing stones and all kinds of things. And so great fodder for a story. Um, they're at this manor um, for the wedding. It's just kind of a small party. And the uh, Marquess of Barbrick, who owns the castle, the, the manor, he has this extensive art collection. Well, Kira, of course, the portrait artist is just completely intrigued with this collection, but she stumbles across um, a forgery and then another. And she has to tell Barbrick he's not very happy. Um, so he asked her into, to investigate, to figure out what's going on. There's some kind of history with some rival clans nearby. And then a maid is found dead beneath the forged painting. And so they have to figure out, is it connected? What's going on? Who murdered the maid? Um, and who, who created the forgeries and when? <laughs> um, Allison, Evil and Emerald is the third in your Harriet Gordon series. What can you tell us about that book? Yeah, I'm way behind Anna on that <laughs> score. Uh, yeah, it's, it's number three. Uh, I have a quite a definite series arc to my stories. So uh, yeah, there, there will be it will be a definite end to the series coming up but no, this is number three and uh, in this uh, particular story Harriet has taken to uh, amateur theatre and uh, she's been dragooned into joining the uh, Singapore Amateur Dramatic and Music Society otherwise known as Saddams uh, to do the Christmas production of Pirates of Penzance. Um, I, I was, there's a lot of me in this story because I, I, I was involved in the Gilbert and Sullivan Society that did Pirates of Penzance. Um, so I had quite a lot of fun writing little bits of that in. But um, the, uh, the leading man is found, uh, found dead in, the, in a fire um, quite early on in the piece. And this sets in train a, a tragic um, number of uh, events that... Uh, um, of course, ends up with a crime having to be solved. But if, if you read the Harriet Gordon stories, as I said, you, you will see there's a series arc and uh, um, her Harriet's offsider, um, Inspector Curran, who wouldn't, would hate to be called her offsider, but in reality he is. Uh, he, ha he has family difficulties, I'll put it that way. And uh, he ends up in a bit of a mess at the end of the story. So it was good fun to write. I had fun, I had real fun doing it. <laughs> Anna, I was fascinated by a perilous perspective about the forgery part to the story, because when you think about art forgeries, today it's very easy to detect. I mean, there's 
x-ray, all these scientific things. Right. Get, how did back in the early 1800s, how did they, how could they tell? The yeah, I, that was one of the things when I was diving into the research, I really had to figure out because because there is all this modern technology we now use. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a lot of, you know, what would she have known and be able to deduce? Like, for example, the varnish thing. I mean, they would have had the chemicals to try to wipe off some of that varnish. She would have realized uh, something that fascinated me is that oil paintings actually take about a hundred years to completely dry. So if you can use a little bit of a chemical and it comes off, then it's less than a hundred years. I mean, like linseed oil and things like that. And so uh, she would know all these things. She would know about how varnish discolors and that to try to test that um, and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it, it was it was very tricky, but it was also so fascinating. There's it was one of those research things where I had to pull myself out of it because there was just so much I was learning about, um, you know, the canvases, the back sides, you know, they would use like um, some forgers will try to find a canvas from that era and paint over whatever's there because then the canvas is looks legit. It is seems legit or the stretchers on the back of it um, because eventually they break on so many paintings. Um, and they have to change them. But if you can find one from that era that has the stretcher that looks legit, that's that old, you know, stretcher type, then, you know, that can seem to make it, you know, more, more legit. Um, so all these things, um, it was, it was really interesting and, and fun to try to have Kira use her art know-how to figure out is this real or not. And, and you would also use artist technique. There's that, just that, knowing that Van Dyke paints paintings like this. And so if it's if it's different, then it's probably not him, just the brush strokes. They always talk about how the brush strokes are like fingerprints for an artist. Did, while you were researching, did you discover at that time period, were there any like hot artists that were frequently forged or is there a market for certain? I didn't uh, discover, I, I did discover <laughs> that so many, uh, they didn't really take care of the paintings like like we do now that we know you need to do. Like the housekeeper would be in charge of taking care of the paintings and they would clean them with like strange things like urine. I mean, like they had no idea what they were doing. These, these wealthy aristocrats had these paintings and their servants are, are cleaning them with just horrible things. And even the art preservers, like the, the people that were supposed to preserve art, they didn't think of it in the same way we do now. They would, they would, there would be a problem with the painting and they would think, oh, I can, I can improve on this. I mean, can you imagine you have a, you know, a Van Gogh in front of you or I, I can just improve on this or, or a, um, oh, he would be too. Rembrandt or someone. Yeah. Just anyway, a flower it was just the corner, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit, little bit about your settings because you both write historical series. I know, Allison, for you, the choice to set your series in Singapore before the First World War was a very deliberate choice. Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, it was, because, well, firstly, it, uh, uh, the history, as I said, uh, really interested me. And if you've ever been to Singapore in recent years, you'll know it's a very modern city and it's very hard to find, find the uh, history underneath it all. But it's there if you look hard enough. And there's, there, I tend to find fiction written about Singapore tends to be set around World War II, which of course was a very dramatic and very difficult time for, for the city state. Um, there's, a, there's very little written of that, you know, set in the earlier, earlier days and the earlier colonial days. I mean, colonial days are, are not a fashionable period to be writing in any way. Um, and I wanted to sort of um, capture that moment just sort of at the tail end, you know, the, the sun was beginning to set on the British Empire and it, 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 there's almost that hint of what's going to be coming in four years time because I, I set the stories, began to set the stories in 1910. So um, particularly in Revenge in Rubies, which was around an, a military unit, I, I could, I felt I could sort of kind of drop in that almost perception that these young men were going to their deaths in, in, in a few years time. Um, so it was that lovely combination of almost almost the end of empire but still clinging on to uh, onto this idea of uh, gracious edwardian living um yeah and i mean what a time I'm, i lived in singapore and i would have died if i'd had to wear corsets and <laughs> stockings and no air conditioning and uh, i mean no no electric fans even so uh, how how these 
women particularly survived. I have no idea. I know you beautifully portray that too. I remember the first book when I first first reading it. I mean, you could just feel the sweat dripping off them, oh, you know, absolutely. underneath their corsets. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yes, women, women glow, uh, men perspire, and horses sweat. Is that right? <laughs> Something like that. There was a lot of glowing going on in, in the stories. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, it, it, it it's fun because it wasn't a period it wasn't a period anybody had ever really tackled before. So I had a lot of fun doing that. Anna, why did you choose for the Lady Darby series the early nineteenth century? Yeah, so I picked eighteen thirties for a couple reasons. One, nobody was using it. There's a lot of Regency, <laughs> like early nineteenth, and mm -hmm. then there's a lot of Victorian. But very few people um, do William the Fourth's reign. And when I started looking into it, there was just so much fascinating stuff going on. Um, you know, politically, there's all kinds of act reform acts and Catholic Emancipation Acts and all these things passing. And there's a lot of upheaval and changes in the Industrial Revolution and all of that. And the other reason was because I gave Lady Darby that background where her first husband was an anatomist and she was forced to help with to, to watch his dissections, to sketch them for his anatomy textbook that he was writing um because this was be this was pre Gray's Anatomy that didn't come about to the 1850s um you know I thought Burke and Hare is 1828 1829 and um, then the London Burkers are 1831 it was just this perfect time period before the passage of the Anatomy Act when body snatchers were still working and and there would be a lot of panic about you know people being murdered off the street and sold to the anatomists to be to be dissected it was it was a real thing and so the fact that she has this scandalous background and then that just feeds into that fear and, and that stigma. So um, we kind of all just came together and it, it's, I've loved delving into it and kind of making it my own. <laughs> oh, I wonder if one of the reasons the 1830s isn't popular is because the fashions are so hideous. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> I hate, oh my gosh. It's probably <laughs> one of the ugliest fashion periods it has to be. I mean, they were just not attractive dresses, no, uh, really especially was. to our modern senses. But I've loved like playing off that because Kira just absolutely hates them, you know, so <laughs> it's a lot of fun to be able to, you know, you've got the fashionable people that are wearing them and she's like, oh, you know, and as a painter, how are you supposed to move around in these massive sleeves and paint, you know? <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Um, historical accuracy is very important to both of you as writers, and that comes across in your stories. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about researching a book? Um, are there particular sources that you find most useful if somebody else might be wanting to know more about the period? And also, as kind of a sidebar to that, what have you discovered while researching your series about your historical period that surprised you the most? And why don't we start with you, Anna? Um, so I love finding primary sources, journals and memoirs and letters. Um, they give you a real feel for, for the language of the period. I, I particularly use these a lot in my Verity Kent series, which is set like 1919, 1920s, because you really get that rhythm of that language. Um, so, you know, even, but even in the Lady Darby series, I, I love those kind of sources. Um, and there's a lot of really good social histories. I mean, uh, like, for example, the book uh, and, uh, An Artless Demise is set during the London Burkers is a book by Sarah Wise called The um, Italian Boy that was just absolutely invaluable. It had so much wonderful information, not only about that subject of the London Burkers, but just you know, London as it was in 1831 and the social history and all those kind of things. Um, so those kind of things are our favorite sources for me. And I also, my best tip to give others is that to check the bibliography in the back of books that you read, research books you read, because you will always stumble across, you know, their sources for their material and find things you may not have found otherwise. I found several, um, you know, memoirs that way, you know, just, oh, oh, you know, and they were using, you know, firsthand accounts and diaries of people that lived in that period that weren't, aren't necessarily famous, but they have lots of good information to provide. How about you, Allison? Yeah, sim similarly, prim primary sources are, are primary. Um, my, my first go-to is actually the Straits Times, because actually nothing happened in Singapore in 1910. <laughs> 
<laughs> apart from the opening opening of the Anderson Bridge, which was in the first book. Um, so it's all just little social social chit chat and snippets of this and that, and uh, and, and and other you know external things come into it, like uh, like the arrest of Dr. Crippen, which I was able to uh, to use word for word in the second book. Um, uh, that 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 would be of interest to the readers of the time. Um, pictures are really important for me. Mm. Um, I, I actually have Pinterest board. I keep Pinterest boards for all my books. And as I find, because Singapore, as I said, doesn't look anything like it does today. And I mean, it's actually doubled in size. <laughs> A lot of land reclamation gone on. So to actually recreate that world of, of the, that Harriet moved in, um, the best source for me was actually to find a, a, a contemporary map. Uh, mm. It took me a long time to, to find one. And my God, it's the best map in the world. It even has the names of all the, the little plantations and everything around the, around the outskirts of the city. Fantastic. And of course, street names have changed and the, the sea boundaries changed. And um, you can't skip across Beach Road to go to the beach anymore at, if you're at Raffles, for example, as uh, Harriet, um, Harriet and Simon do at the beginning of... Um, emerald um so it's those little things that i just i just little snippets but i've also loved finding the real people as well um and love writing them in it's um cuscadon who's who's karen's boss who was very much a real person uh everyone called him tim but uh, karen calls him sir uh, there is a cuscadon place off orchard road in singapore so he's he's still remembered um there's mad radley who uh, who ran the botanical gardens he came into it and my favorite of all is the one i i uh, i use in uh, emerald who was montague pet the uh, superintendent of the fire brigade part because i worked for a fire brigade so i have a great uh, a great fondness for, for fire brigades but monty pet was <laughs> a very real person who did amazing things in singapore and later on uh, had a very long career in china in canton i think um, and, and just working, weaving those those people into the stories is is just great. I, I think I've found Mr. Sands, who started the Scouts. I'd love to write him into a story a little further along the line. But uh, yeah, so no, so nothing leaps out and says, "Wow, this is the most amazing fact." But it, it's putting all of those things together. Go, wow, that's what Raffles Place looked like in 1910, or that's what mm -hmm. the map looked like. It's just that build. It's that world, whole world building that I I love. Um, let's talk a little bit about series um, from an author's perspective. What are the advantages to writing a series? Um, are there any challenges? And I also want to kind of let our readers know that um, when we say series, that doesn't always mean you have to read each book in order. You can sometimes come to the new book, and if an author is particularly skilled, they'll bring you in enough so that you can read the story. But um, talk a little bit about your um, relationship with writing series, and we'll start with Alison. Uh, well, I, I came to series fairly recently, actually. I, I actually write two series because I write the Harriet Gordon series, but at the same time, I've been writing a, a series set in Australia in the Victorian goldfields, which is very close to my heart. And that series, the continuation character is the town itself and uh, the various smaller characters that inhabit that particular town, which is a very different series to Harriet, where it's continuation characters that uh, are running through. And um, they both have advantages and disadvantages. The, the continuation town is easy because I can just plop new characters, in, uh, main characters in and, uh, and they pick up and move on with their own. Very easy to make a one. Um, a standalone story that way. Uh, Harriet's getting a, a, Anna will probably agree with the, the, the further you go into the series, the harder it is to make the book standalone, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and as readers get more and more invested in the characters too, I'm finding I'm getting all sorts of suggestions as to where the book, where the series needs to go next. <laughs> I'll have to talk to the characters about that. They have their own ideas, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I, try, I try and make each individual book a, a standalone mystery, but um, there is that issue of uh, of having an actual series arc as well that that I can make make sense to a reader who will pick up book three and go. And it seems seems from feedback I've got from readers, it seems to work okay. I've been getting oh well now I've got to go back and read books one and two. Yes, <laughs> that's great. Um, so it seems to work for them, but it, it, I do find the continuation characters harder than the continuation town. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I would I would say my the biggest advantage to me is that 
you don't have to wrap up a character story arc in one mm. book. Um, yes. So you can really delve deep and really, you know, ex really explore it to its full extent. I mean, uh, one of the underlying themes in the Lady Derby series is the treatment of women and especially the abuse mm. of women. And, you know, it feels short shrift sometimes when, when there's a, you know, a story about a woman who's up overcoming domestic abuse for her to, you know, all of a sudden have a happy ending super fast, you know, so to be able to get to explore that and to really stretch that out and to let them grow and, and, you know, all those kind of things and all the characters, um, you know, even the secondary characters, you can have these much larger arcs and, and come and go with them and, and see them change. So I love, that's one of my favorite things about it. And one of the big advantages, I think, but yeah, the challenge, it definitely is, um, you know, as you go along, it gets, it does get a little trickier to catch people up in the book. So, so you want people to always be able to enter the series in any book. And so you need to make sure that they're not lost about what's going on, but you also don't want to bore people who have read all the other books. So mm -hmm. you don't want to have this big info dump at the beginning. So it can get really tricky the further you go along um, feeding that information back in, in the right, in the right way. So, yeah. Mm. I totally agree about how, about being able to really play with a character's own story and, and really, um, tease out all the little bits and pieces. I yes. mean, I've got two, two, two fairly, fairly damaged characters, my main characters, and, uh, I, I, they're, they're just deeply embedded in me now. And, Oh, I have great fun with them. <laughs> you can just really get into that psychology and really yeah, yeah. do it justice, I feel like. So. Well, abs absolutely. And uh, as you know, Har Harriet had that awful experience as a suffragette in Holloway and um, Curran, Curran had his uh, own, he's got his own issues as well. And uh, yes, it's, uh, I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, both of you, in addition to the mysteries that form kind of the structure of your series, have woven in a few threads of romance for your characters. Was that intentional? Did that just come organically by introducing your main characters together? Talk about that in your series and we'll start with you, Anna. Yeah, um, for me, I love romance. Um, I, I love mystery, history and romance. So I, I wanted all three in my books. It just feels natural, um, especially mm -hmm. because as people, you know, we, we look for love. I mean, it's just a natural extension of who we are. And so, um, and it, and it also kicks up the danger. It heightens the tension, all these different things. So to me, it was just natural to have those things. And, you know, I've got the, the romances between the main characters, but also even having those secondary characters, it's getting, it's fun to get to play with it in all different forms and ways. Um, so yeah, for me, it was totally natural. Yeah, look, that's that's my background. I I, I come from writing stories with happy ever afters. Um, I, I call my, I call myself a romance writer when I'm not writing historical mysteries. So yes, having having a happy ever after for my characters was always my kind of end game. Um, but yeah, I was going to make it hard for them along the way. And um, if you've read the books, you know that uh, Karen has a relationship that's ongoing and. Uh, and Harriet too has um, found a nice Australian from Melbourne. <laughs> don't know, I don't know where he came from. Um, <laughs> keeping her, keeping her company at the moment. So, um, and and that kind of is life. And uh, as I said, the reader reaction has been really interesting. I've had some readers go, "Oh, I'm so glad you didn't get them together in the first book," and others who go, "Oh, I'm really disappointed. I really wanted them to get together." And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Do the best you can't I can. Please, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, you know, they, they've got their own mind to make up and they'll come to it in their own, own way. That, yeah, it's really weird when your characters talk to you, but uh, Anna knows what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm afraid, yes, like, like Anna, you know, romance, uh, I like a story with a happy ever after. So there will be a happy ever after. I can probably guarantee that, but uh, we've still got to get there yet. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about writing an individual book, because I know many readers are fascinated if they're not writers as to how you create that kind of um, complete product, especially when it comes to mysteries, because you have to think about clues and suspects and you can't just write straightforward. So can you talk about your process? Do you actually kind of plot things out or you just trust you're going to be able to wrap it up? And we'll start with you, Allison. Um, well, I, uh, I'm a hardcore pantser, 
uh, which worked fine when I was writing when I was writing my historical romances, um, because I could really just let those go and see see where the story took me. However, two things had had impacted on me. One was having um, having traditional publishing contracts with deadlines that sort of rather contracted the time period I had available to pants. And, and the second was I found with writing mysteries, I needed to be a lot more organized about, um, about who the characters were, what the setup was. Um, and having said that, I'm, I don't always know who done it. Uh, I know that might come as a surprise to some people or other people who read, read my books and went, well, that makes sense now. I didn't know who did it till the end. Um, I do have an idea who did it, but uh, I've got to get there. You know, it's not just taking the reader on the journey. I've actually got to get there as well. And sometimes the characters won't cooperate and uh, it's and somebody comes from left field, as, as happened in Revenge in Rubies. And uh, it, it was a completely different outcome to the one I had proposed to my to my publisher. So uh, so I now call myself a planter. <laughs> so, a, a half plotter, a half pencil that's still mostly a pencil. <laughs> but I think what makes it easy for me is I use a word pro I, I use a program called Scrivener and um, I, I treat it I, I'm, a, I'm a full time writer now so I treat it as a coming from a corporate background it's a project and I, I organize it as a project and I can do that very easily on Scrivener. That's funny because I'm very much in the middle. Also, I, I, I call myself a plotzer because <laughs> same kind of thing, you know. Um, so I have an outline. I definitely have an outline. I so I know where I'm going when I'm starting with. I have a lot of my main points and I fill in a lot of the gaps. Um, but I like to leave a lot of room to play because I find if I plan it out too tightly, I don't enjoy writing it. I don't enjoy that, that inspiration mm, of getting to write it and amazing. discovering it for myself. Um, and also my characters rebel. I mean, they're like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this instead. <laughs> and yeah, there are some characters that are more notorious for that than others, but um, <laughs> I just find it's just more creative when I just let myself go with it. And so, um, so I do do an outline, but I always, I always find it goes off the tracks at some point and I have to, I end up back on and it takes detours. And, um, and then I usually get about um, maybe 70% through the book and I have to stop and kind of re replot um, to figure out that what the final ending will be. I also like to leave it loose like you do, Allison. And I don't always know who the, who the murderer is um, because I've written it too many times and somebody else has stood up and said, no, I did it. And I'm like, oh, that's way better. And so then I have to go back yeah. and fix all fix all this stuff. So um, I try to set it up as I'm writing that it can be multiple different people. And then once I've finished that first draft, I can go back and finesse it and fix it all in edits. So um, so yeah, I, that's funny. We're very much similar in the and we're the middle ground. <laughs> we are. Yep. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. And what kind of readers were you? You write historical mysteries, you write histor uh, historical romance, different things. Is that because that's what you love as a reader or are you totally opposite in your reading taste? Talk to us a little bit about your reading life and we'll start with you, Anna. Yeah, I love, I would say I read mostly mysteries, historical fiction and romance in varying combinations. Those are I write what I like to read and I, I do read other things too, but those are the main subjects of fiction that I like to read. And then I do read a lot of nonfiction just because I'm doing research, but also there's just certain subjects I, I find interesting and I want to read about it. So um, yeah, and I, and I grew up that way. I, I really came up, I was a big mystery reader when I was a kid um, and a teen and you know, I read, then I discovered romance, I read those, and, and history is just always, fat. it was my favorite subject in school, so, so I guess none of it's surprising that those three are, are my favorites. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm the same, um, I, my father loved history, and he would, he'd read to us every Sunday evening, Sunday afternoons, highly unsuitable books for eight-year-olds, I have to say, you know, like the King's <laughs> General, Daphne du Maurier, he was never, he was never one for reading Winnie the Pooh or anything like that, but he absolutely fired my love of historical fiction, um, and yeah, I, when I started writing, I was writing the sort of stories that I liked I like to read, which were historical adventure, lots of doing daring do and and a happy ever after. 
so of course that's obviously what I started writing so but I was at a Romance Writers of Australia conference and we had a guest speaker from from America who I was hosting at the time and she turned to me one day and said what do you read mostly and I had to stop and think I thought well actually I mostly read um, crime and mysteries and she looked me in the eye and said well why aren't you writing them <laughs> because it's too hard <laughs> it's a totally different discipline to writing romances but she really she really got me thinking and th and and looking at evaluating what I was reading and I was listening to audiobooks going to in, in my commute from work and they were always without fail um, a mystery of contemporary or a historical mystery I'm, I'm fairly uh, broad in my tastes in that sense and uh, yeah so um mysteries historical fiction and romance that's that's what i read um now in addition to your current series the lady darby and the harriet gordon books i know that you have written other kinds of things in your case anna you have another ongoing series actually i think you have two because there's a new addition to your gothic myths books can you tell us about those <laughs> Um, yeah, so Verdi, my Verdi Kent series is set in uh, 1919, 1920. It's right after World War One. Um, Verdi was a Secret Service agent for the British um, during the war, and her husband Sidney was a, it was a veteran, a war veteran, a war hero. Um, and when I was researching that series, it was just fascinating because there's thousands of women who worked for the British Secret Service during the war, and none of us know anything about them until mm. they released a lot of their documents in the early 2000s. And all of a sudden, there was all these great grandmothers saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I was a spy, you know, like, I mean, so it's just really fascinating because we think of World War II and women being in British intelligence, but not World War I. And so I get to really delve into that and a lot of the things that happened after the war and all of that. Um, and then my Gothic mysteries is just kind of a, a labor of love. I, I adore Gothics, um, like Mary Stewart, and Victoria Holt, those kind of things. Um, and so I have a first one that's Secrets in the Mist. And the second one is still in the works. <laughs> it's not finished. I keep trying to finish, but they're um, not contracted. And so I have to finish the books that are contracted. I I'm, have an embarrassment of blessings that I keep getting contracts for other things. Um, yeah. And I can also announce that I'm actually writing a historical fiction novel. Uh, mm -hmm. I just signed a contract for it's um, actually set on the Titanic and it's about three sisters who were actual survivors of the Titanic. And so it's kind of their story um, uh, and what happened. So, I mean, we obviously know what happens ultimately in the end, but <laughs> yeah. for their story. So it, I'm, I'm excited. It's a new challenge. So that's great. Um, Allison, are you continuing to write um, romance in addition to mysteries? I am. I'm exhausted just listening to Anna Lee just then. Um, I find <laughs> it enough balancing what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I had that embarrassment of riches having gone from no contracts at all to having two two book contracts with two mainstream publishers who all wanted the same deadlines and the same long books as well. Um, so I've been balancing the Fortunately, you know, with COVID, I haven't had anything else to do. Um, so I've been balancing those for the last three years. So, yeah, I, I write um, the, the historical romances, for want of a better title. Um, the, the latest ones have been set in um, Australia, obviously, which has been great fun. I finally get to write in my own backyard, which is great. But other than that, I, I'm, I'm very, um, very broad in my, my passion is actually the English Civil War. And so I have quite a number of books set in that that period, um, which is great for me. I, I kind of wrote it out of my system, but uh, very hard to find readers for that particular period. So I'm waiting for it to be in the next Regency, but it doesn't seem to be coming that way. I have written a Regency and I have written a post-World War One story too. So uh, they're great fun as well. But um, I think I'm going to probably um, stick with writing the, Aust the Oztoricals at, uh, for, for the time being going forward. Um, because they're very well received. I think Australians, it took a long time for us to come to terms with our history. I think, I know certainly when I was at school, we thought, you know, we had no civil wars or wars of independence or kings and queens. Well, we did, but distantly. Um, and I think we just thought it was all a bit boring and naff. But um, I, I think as I've traveled around the country and I learned the individual stories of our settlers and uh, the hard lives that they led, uh, I think there's some really great stories to be told here. And uh, I certainly had a lot of fun with the uh, with the Victorian Goldfield stories. So the third book of that one is coming out in January. I've just finished that. So I'm actually between books at the moment. It's a really lovely place to be. I'm having a holiday. <laughs> well, I was having a holiday till I got COVID. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like yeah, so that's that's kind of where we are with those. I think we do have a few questions from some of your fans tuning in. The first okay. one is about titles and covers and your relationship with your publisher. How important are they to you? How much input do you have? Um, why don't we start with Allison? Because if I understand correctly, for your Harriet Gordon books, your publishers decided to do the gemstone. Yeah. Um, yes, well, I had actually called, the first book was titled Singapore Sapphire, uh, even though actually it mostly concerned rubies, which is ironic, but uh, <laughs> there is a sapphire in it. Um, so they kind of leapt onto this idea of uh, having a nice blue cover. And then the second book, um, which is now Revenge in Rubies, was actually called The Colonel's Lady is Dead. And they came back and said, uh, we don't really like that. We'd like, we'd like, <laughs> we'd like a red cover. <laughs> so, so I didn't actually have any ruby. I'd done the rubies in the first book. So I actually had to find a ruby to put into the second book too, which actually justify why it was called Revenge in Rubies. Um, and the third one, I, it was again, my title, which um, that was fairly easy because there is an Emerald Hill in Singapore. And so I set the, I set the uh, action on Emerald Hill. So that's the evil in Emerald of that one. And um, the fourth one probably we called something like Terror in Topaz because they'd like a yellow, a yellow cover. <laughs> As to how much input I get, no, they're pretty good. They do, they do, they do ask me, um, <laughs> which, which is quite whether they take any notice is another question altogether. But I love the uh, cover for Evil in Emerald because they, they really, um, they caught the, there, it's actually a Singapore scene in the background, it's actually the Victoria Hall, which Harriet was supposed to do her performance of Pirates of Penzance in, but of course never quite got there. But yeah, so yes, there is consultation. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the marketing and publicity department really make the decisions. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for me, same, the cover, they do like a cover conference, and so they always consult me ahead of time, mm. have me send pictures of like where the book's set and any ideas for the setting of it and that kind of thing, and and sometimes they do go with my ideas, and sometimes they don't, and they, but usually they come up with something way better if they don't, so I don't, I don't have any complaints, I love the Lady Darby mm. covers, and my Verity Cat covers are gorgeous too, I mean, so, um, just, you know, stellar, so, um, but for the titles, um, for the Lady Darby series, it kind of fell into this, they came up with the first two, and then it kind of fell into this pattern where there's always an arc term, and then there's some kind of death, murder, malice, whatever, so um, I started to get pretty good, good at it, <laughs> and I've done quite a, quite a few of them in a row, um, it's so funny, we're, we're right now trying to decide book 11, we're like brainstorming a million titles, like oh, trying yeah. to find the right one, it, get, it gets trickier the further along you get, because you, you're running out of art terms, you know, so, yeah, uh, or at yeah. least ones that aren't like, you know, facade, does everybody know how to spell facade, you know, so, um, anyway, yes, <laughs> and then the very series, it's, it's very similar, but, um, a lot of them come from me, so just brainstorming. But yeah. uh, I'm going to run out of gemstones, so <laughs> that's why it has to be a short series. <laughs> Death in diamonds and <laughs> peril in peril, you know, peril in pearls. <laughs> oh wow. dear. Another question from one of your uh, fans is, "What is the best piece of advice about writing you've ever received?" And I'll give you a minute, and you can leap in. Well, look, I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, and this is, the, this is the advice I give to any, any aspiring author that asks me. And, and that is to finish the book. Mm. I have seen so many beautifully well-written, beautifully crafted first three chapters, mm. but that's, that's not writing. You have to actually sit down and tell yourself the story. And it's going to be a disgusting hodgepodge. Uh, uh, we call it a dirty draft for a really good reason but it is vaguely book shaped. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. That then when you know the story, that's when you go back and you actually start writing and you, uh, you, you're able to finish. And it, it's, uh, to use a painting analogy, it's like, it's like the rough sketch. And right. then the, the subsequent revisions are when you layer on the oil paint and, and bring the story to life. So trying to, trying to make the first three chapters the best thing you've ever written it's you're never going to finish the book. So um, there was an Australian author who was, yeah, I know I won't quote what she used to say <laughs> for, for sensibility reasons, but yes, finish the book is my, is my best piece of advice. 
That's really good advice. Yeah. And I would say also that, you know, you, you're going to hear a lot of rules and the way it should be done. And you know what, if you ask a hundred authors, what their process is, they all have a hundred different answers. So you have to figure out what works for you and that's okay. You don't have to do what the next person's doing. Um, and yep. you don't always have to strictly follow these rules. I mean, uh, my, my books have a lot of adverbs and you know what, some people would say that's bad, but you know what, they work, they work for the stories I tell. So, um, you know, so you just have to figure out what works for you. Yep. Another question is what books have you read and enjoyed recently? And I would be interested in hearing about that too. Um, I recently finished, uh, Tessa Arlen has a new historical fiction book coming out called, yes. um, Oh shoot, I'm gonna mess it up. The Address of Violet Taffeta, I believe is what it is. It's it. Oh July. yes, it's yeah. excellent. Yeah. Beautiful prose, uh, really good. Um, I think, what else I read recently? I think. I've been reading a lot of research books lately, so I'm trying to remember what I read. Well, I am looking forward to Tessa Arlen's uh, June book, I think is when it comes out. She's okay, yeah. such an amazing. It's like sometime in the summer. <laughs> yeah. or maybe July. It's probably July, I think, now I think about it. But did you read her book about the Royal Nanny from the year before? Yes. That was a terrific book, too. It was good. Yes. Um, what about you, Allison? Um, yeah, I'm just sneakily looking at my Kindle here, know, and it's really, it's really, it's really misleading reading? because my husband uses my Kindle accounts, and I think he's on an Anna Lee Huber um, binge at the moment because they're all Anna Lee Hubers, <laughs> and I have to confess I'm a bit behind with my 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 reading of your books. Um, I, I'm reading C.S. Harris's uh, book at the moment, When Blood Lies. Ooh. She's an auto auto buy for me. Yes, Candy. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so that's my current read at the moment. And prior to that, I was reading um, uh, Slow Horses, which was uh, it's a TV. It came on as a TV series um, about MI5. So I mean, that's how that's how broad my my reading wow. tastes are. And otherwise, I'm I'm kind of reading a a a, a, um, a, a history of Australia at the moment, which is what's really dull, doesn't it? But they're very it's very funnily written. It's very witty. So I'm kind of, that's my bedtime reading, a few a few pages of that before I go to sleep. Called Gert, I'm up to Gert by Nation. So, uh, so that's my, kind of, yes, very, very different kind of reading at the moment. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions before we run out of um, airtime. The next one is, what is your uh, author relationship with social media platforms? Do you have a favorite? Um, Anna? Um, so I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, uh, gosh, I don't know. I would say, I think Instagram is kind of becoming my favorite. Um, I'm just enjoying, it's kind of fun to have the images and forcing myself to be creative about uh, posting the, that picture. You know, sometimes there's not a readily made photo to go. Um, and I, and I, I find it's a little more positive, you know what I mean? So when I'm scrolling through it, I rarely come across anything negative. So sometimes where the world can get to get a little heavy. <laughs> so it's nice to have that, those fun, those fun posts to scroll through. So. I guess you're channeling your inner Lady Darby or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm likewise. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and, and Twitter. I keep trying to get off Twitter, but I can't do it entirely. So I'm really not there very often. I, and it's really just to post up things like, "Hey, I'm doing an interview tomorrow." <laughs> Boys and men. Um, my my. I like. I'm coming to Instagram, but I'm not as artistic as you are. So. I, Tend to be a lot of pictures of my cat. Um, <laughs> hey, people love cats. So I know, don't... I know. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a bit of an Instagram star, is the old Toby. Uh, when I get when I run out of things to do, here's another picture of Toby. Um, I, I think Facebook is my is my happy place. Uh, I have I have author pages for Alison Stewart and A M Stewart, and uh, a profile a fairly generous profile. I'm make most people happy I'm happy to be friends with most people and a little readers group in there as well and uh, yeah that's my tribe and uh, of writers and readers and uh, that that's where you'll find me the most M way maybe way too much really I have books to write <laughs> 
Uh, we've got one last, I guess it's a comment, but you might be able to elaborate on it. Anna, they said they loved your read along. So I guess you're doing a read along of one of your series. Yeah, I did a Lady Darby read along. I mean, we were all stuck, you know, at home for this pandemic, not having you know, so I decided um, for the build up to book 10, I did a, a, a read along on, I was mostly on Facebook. I made a Facebook group that people could join and it's still there. You can still join and look back through the posts if you're, if you're curious, but we read one book or a novella from the Lady Derby series every month because there was 11, you know, including those no novellas to, to build up to book 10. Um, and it was a lot of fun just getting to read to revisit those some of those stories I haven't read in years you know um, and I shared behind the scenes information and I did uh, like a Facebook live um, event at the end of every month just to answer some questions and things like that so yeah <laughs> I got asked if I'm going to do Verity Kent and I, I said yeah probably at some point but I need a little break <laughs> Mm. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it was a big commitment, but it, it was really popular. I, I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm glad it I'm glad it turned out as well as it did. So um, before we go, can you, if you'd like, can you share with us what's coming next for you as an author? Anna, do you want to start? Um, so next for me, uh, so a perilous perspective, Lady Derby 10 just released last week, and you can get it at the Poison Pen. Um, and um, August 30th, uh, Verity Kent book six, A Certain Darkness, um, is releasing, uh, and you can pre-order that at the Poison Bed. <laughs> and then I am writing Lady Darby book 11 right now. It'll be out next spring. So, Allison? Uh, well, I'm waiting on a decision about book four of Harriet at the moment, so I have no, no news on Harriet whatsoever, which is probably very frustrating for some of my readers. But the, the next thing I have coming out is The Homecoming, which is the third in the uh, Maiden's Creek series, which you can't get at the, <laughs> the Poison Fed, but is fairly easily obtainable uh, in other, other online areas if you're in the States. Um, but is avail will be available everywhere on, on shelves in Australia. Um, yeah, so that will be coming out in January next year. So, so that's, that's really all my news as to what's happening next. As I said, I'm actually having a bit of, enjoying a bit of a break at the moment, so. <laughs> Sometimes nice. it's very nice, yeah. It is, it's very, I, I've worked very hard the last few years, I deserve it. <laughs> um, well, I can't believe how quickly our time has flown by. I would like to thank our visiting authors, Alison Stewart, whose new book is Evil and Emerald, and Annalie Huber, whose new book is A Perilous Perspective, for taking time to stop by the Poison Pen virtually and share uh, their thoughts and feelings with us. And I would like to thank those tuning in um, to another recorded author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you. Now I'm going to try clicking buttons and in case I lose you all, which often happens. Um, thank you both. You were terrific, <laughs> I guess. I really enjoyed it. Uh, oh. Congratulations on your historical novel, Anna. I'm going to look for that. Oh, future. thank you. It was really great to, to chat with you guys. <laughs> Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.